This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Civil discourse has become increasingly coarse. As we have become more passionate about where we stand, we have loosened our grip on traditional standards of good taste, and the result is increased rancor and less communication, or at least miscommunication. As an example, speaking this weekend at CPAC 2019, the annual political conference attended by conservative activists and elected officials from across the nation and hosted by the American Conservative Union, President Trump unleashed a fusillade of derogatories when talking about various individuals and topics not limited to but including the word for bovine excrement. Sure, we have heard those words for years, and we've witnessed fifth-grade playground characterizations of opponents, but historically not from the President of the United States, and usually not from conservatives. And yet now, we don't bat an eye. This has become our new normal, and this example is a mild one when it comes to present-day approaches to those with whom we disagree. The tone is set from the top down. That's what leadership is about. So if we're concerned about our decreasing decorum and how we can have a conversation that might lead to common ground or even an intelligent disagreement, we can't expect change to start at the top in our present environment. So change is on us. According to our guests this hour, polite disagreement is the way forward. Perhaps if we want to maintain our nation, it is the only way forward, but how? We're going to spend the hour discussing that with Amanda Ripley. She's a contributing writer to The Atlantic and the author of two New York Times bestsellers, one of which was turned into a PBS documentary. She joins us from the studios of NPR in Washington. Amanda, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Mike. And Amanda Ripley is actually actually going to be here in Charlotte on March 14th and 15th to speak about this topic in a presentation called Can We Talk at Queen's University of Charlotte? And joining us in our studio are two of the people helping to organize that event. Rick Thames is a visiting professor of journalism in the Queen's James L. Knight School of Communication and former executive editor of the Charlotte Observer. He is coordinating the forum. Welcome back to the program. Good morning, Mike. Morning. And Sherry Paula Watkins is executive director director of the North Carolina Humanities Council. She helped bring this forum to Queen's University. Thank you for joining us as well. Delighted to be here this morning. As we go through the show, you may want to join our conversation. You can by emailing us at charlottetalks at wfae.org. Search for WFA on Facebook. Get to WFA. Get to us on Twitter at uh, Charlotte Talks. And you can even watch us on Facebook Live this morning. Let me start with you, Amanda. You're the journalist. You've written, uh, well, Rick's the journalist too, but you're a journalist. You've written for uh, many of our major outlets, Time, the New York Times, Slate, Politico, the Wall Street Journal, the Times of London, and of course Atlantic. You have a piece this morning in the Atlantic. And I'm told that you realized at some point in your career that you weren't completely prepared for dealing with conflict and with people you disagreed with. Was that a discovery in your personal life or did that come as the result of covering stories? You know, it came really late. I'm embarrassed to say. I think I was doing this 20 some years and then and then I start and I thought I was pretty good at conflict. I mean, you know, I covered, you know, disasters and crime and terrorism and gun rights and all kinds of controversial issues. Uh, I wasn't afraid of conflict. Um, it was part of what I did, uh, like most journalists. But then I spent a few months last year with people who manage conflict and navigate conflict differently than journalists. People like diplomats, like ministers, like uh, conflict mediators, people who study conflict in actual laboratories. And I discovered that I was wrong. Like I did not actually have enough skills and tools for really dealing with conflict in a way that was interesting and refreshing sometimes and constructive. Like I just, I, I understood the top level of conflict, but not the understory, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I know you can, you observed them and you also consulted with uh, some folks uh, d- about professionals, uh, about how they deal with conflict. Uh, how substantially different is it from what you were doing? Quite different <laughs> from what most journalists do, I would say. Yeah, yeah it was quite different and, and humbling in, in that sense. Yeah, Because they uh, – is, is it a more psychological – we'll talk about the, the basics of it. I mean, the, the nitty-gritty of it later on. But is it more psychological in its approach? I mean, diplomats have a, have a nasty habit because I've had them on this program of saying nothing. <laughs> they don't, because they don't want to offend anybody. So uh, what, what is their approach to this? Well – what I learned is that basically most conflicts are not about what they appear to be about. 
So uh-huh. there's the surface level talking points, right? He said this, I said this, you said this, you're terrible, I'm great. But then there's this whole understory. There's this whole, this other much more interesting and way more important uh, conflict under the surface. And getting to that is the whole trick, like getting, excavating that. And there are tricks. Like, I think there are definitely tricks to doing it. But it's way more interesting than continually hearing the same he said, she said, back mm-hmm. and forth um, that w- we've been doing for, for years now in politics. So, Sherry, Paula will, uh, Watkins, you're the person that's responsible, I'm told, for helping to bring this conversation to Queens later on in the month on March uh, the 14th. How did this come to your attention? How did this uh, forum come to be? Uh, has it been done elsewhere? It has been done elsewhere. There are 55 state councils and U.S. territories that are called the Humanities Council. So we are North Carolina's Humanities Council. So an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, our association was approached by Mellon Foundation and said, would your council be interested, your series of the power of the 56 state councils, um, would they be interested in taking up journalism and media literacy, fostering informed citizens? As a state council, our mission is fostering understanding. And we were like, yes, this is what we're seeing in our state, that people need to learn how to discuss with each other over the community table again, who we are, and then to really sit back, take defenses off, but really listen. And so really fortunate that Rick Timms joined our board the same time this grant opportunity was available. And so I reached out to Rick, and we've been working on a series of other programs over the past year, and this is our finale. Um, in collaboration with Queen's University to really bring this together. And then a solution uh, jour- network journalism came to us as well and is a sponsor of the program. So we're really excited to have both experts, Amanda Rick. Ripley's and Rick Timms to help us curate something that gets people to the table. You just talked about journalism, and and Amanda writes extensively about journalism and its influence on this. And Rick, you're a journalist, and you you ran the Charlotte Observer for a very long time. Uh, are are, Are we the ones primarily responsible for the coarseness of our discourse today? No, we're. I would not say that at all. I, I think journalists, um, however, are in a position to help things go better. And I, I was struck by what Amanda found and how it related to my own um, understanding and my own career, what I had experienced, and and it really rang true for me. And so, so I think what she's, she has to say speaks specifically to journalists, but it also speaks more broadly to anyone who's having. A problem now in society having an intelligent conversation with someone with an opposing point of view. If you're a liberal, you're mad as hell at the president right now. If you are a conservative, you were just probably as angry about President Obama. Uh, and and on both sides, both sides have justification uh, f- for that anger. It would seem to me. And but this forum is being billed as nonpartisan. In this environment, everything is political. What, what the, the brand of toothpaste that you use is practically political. How do you have a nonpartisan forum on what has become a very partisan divide? Well, it's nonpartisan in the sense that what we are offering to people, it doesn't matter what your politics is. It's going to help you. That's the point. And we want everyone to feel that they can come and gain a better understanding of someone with an opposite point of view. So... Um, It doesn't mean that you'll come and necessarily have your views changed. We're not trying to do that. We're just trying to say, come and understand how you can relate to the people who are talking very differently than you are. Sometimes it seems almost in a different language than you are. You're perplexed about that. Let's come together and see if we can have a better understanding. In fact, Amanda, you say in one of your articles about this that we literally are not speaking the same language anymore. How do you explain that? How, how did we get to this point? You know, for a while I was studying this as a political polarization issue, and there's a lot of research on that, and we've, been, we've all done stories on that. But I actually think that's the wrong frame. When I started looking at it as a conflict, as an intractable conflict, it made a lot more sense. And when you look at all kinds of intractable conflict, whether it's 
uh, you know, with a neighbor or between two gangs or in Northern Ireland or <laughs> any kind of intractable conflict, you see this. People start speaking different languages. They see the same set of facts and interpret it totally differently. They see symbols totally differently. They see good versus evil, us versus them. And it's, you know, it's, it's actually profoundly disconcerting to see that in the United States of America. But yeah. that is what I think the right frame to look at it is, is conflict. I'm not sure how long ago this was that this came to my attention, but we were doing a program about bias. And uh, uh, conservatives were pointing to words being used by journalists on the air and in newspapers, words that to me seemed very innocent and, and uh, accurate and descriptive of what they were writing about. And they saw bias in the choice of words being used by journalists. When you were the editor of The Observer, did you know, did you know about that? Did you notice that? Were, you, were, were editors trying to be aware of that as they edited the paper? Yes, editors were trying to be very aware of that. And, and similarly, at points, they would be perplexed about um, a phrase or a particular word that would make people believe uh, that somehow they had taken a point of view in that story or that headline. Um, and so this this is a struggle for for everyone, really, to understand, you know, I may hear something, and you may hear something, and you're hearing very different things. Right. So, and, and conservatives seem to have been on the cutting edge of noticing that. They, uh, maybe because they were more sensitive to it, or they were living in a an environment that was politically at least controlled by liberals at the time, because the Democrats ran the Congress, and they had uh, the Supreme Court, and they had the White House at the time this be began happening. But now liberals are talking about dog whistle words and phrases, which are uh, code words for what's really underlying a comment, but the, but the phrases look innocent. Amanda, are both sides equally guilty of this? I mean, look, Mike, I'm not going to decide <laughs> which side's more or less guilty, right? It depends on the situation. I know that's a really annoying answer, but... There are times when uh, when the coded language is much worse on the right uh, and much more virulent, given our history of racism in this country, much more dangerous in that sense. There are other times, and sometimes this is at the local, state, or national level, and often in mainstream media, not always, when liberals are also using language that infuriates the right, and sometimes on both sides, there is not awareness <laughs> of how they're being perceived. Sometimes there is. Sometimes it's intentional. So you get this huge range of behavior on both sides, and it's, it's hard to say who is worse and who is better. But the point is, when you don't have any idea how you are being heard by half the country, mm. you are in a bad place, whether you're a politician or a citizen, or a journalist. So are you saying that most people who are engaging in, this, in these con kinds of, uh, the use of these kinds of words, speaking a different language, are unaware that they are speaking that language? I don't know about most. Some are definitely aware, right? Sometimes national politicians are certainly aware. But some of them are not aware. I, I think it's getting harder. You almost need like a translator to know <laughs> when... Like the word dialogue, for instance, a lot of the groups that get people to talk across political divides use the word dialogue. Right. And I met uh, conservatives who really don't like that word, you know. I and know. Uh, so, so it's the kind of thing you, you have to get fluent in both languages. And that's getting harder and harder to do because we don't interact across political divides as much as we used to. We don't marry or date across political divides. We don't live with people who think differently as often. So, you know, it's getting hard to do. It's like, you know learning Greek or something. I want to come uh, back to that innocent word in a second, dialogue. That just seems like a very innocent word to me. We're going to take a break and come right back at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Taylor Richards and Conger presenting the Hermena Gildo Zenga Trunk Show March 22nd and 23rd at the Phillips Place location. TRC, embracing the philosophy that good taste is always in style. Details at trcstyle.com. And Mazda of South Charlotte, committed to bridging the gap between adventure and adventurer by helping people select vehicles that fit, fit one's lifestyle. More at MazdaofSouthCharlotte.com. The history of rock and roll 
is littered with instances of gun violence, and local Charlotte author, playwright, musician Jeff Jackson uses some of that history as the basis for his novel, Destroy All Monsters. In it, Jackson invokes the ghost of Johnny Ace, who died in an accidental gun suicide in 1954. His version explores why violence is so embedded in music and why it doesn't have to be. Jeff Jackson joins us on this program tomorrow at 9. The president has made it clear. We cannot be the policemen of the world. But for a brief moment after the Cold War, it was. Nowadays, Russia, China, and Iran are working hard to destabilize Western democracies in general and the American system in particular. What can we do about that? Author Michael Mandelbaum on the rise and fall of peace on Earth. That's next time on 1A. 1A coming up right after Charlotte Talks from 10 to noon. Here on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on listener-funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about where we are in the country today, not being able to talk to each other anymore about about practically anything because of the deep divide and because we speak two different languages, the left and right, and how we can get beyond this and start over again. Amanda Ripley's with us. She's a speaker and author uh, of The Unthinkable and the Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way, and also several articles about this topic in The Atlantic, the most recent of which came out this morning. Rick Thames is here, visiting professor at the James L. Knight School of Communication at Queen's University of Charlotte and former executive editor of the Charlotte Observer. And Sherry Paula Watkins Paula Watkins is executive director of the North Carolina Humanities Council. Let's go back to that innocent word, dialogue, that people on the right evidently don't like. And we were just talking off the air, Amanda, you couldn't hear us because you're in Washington. But in the studio, we we're just talking about other words that have been turned into verbs that we don't like. Is it the fact that dialogue has become a verb? Or is it because they would just rather you say, let's have a conversation or let's talk about this, as opposed to saying, well, let's dialogue. (laughs) Yeah, I think it sounds kind of squishy and new agey and academic and kind of like things that people associate with liberal elites, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think a conversation would be a better (laughs) better word in in that situation. This, um, this, the fact that we speak different languages, if we don't understand each other, Sherry, that leads to a lack of trust automatically. It does. It, it's, I think, a show of our broken relationships around the community table. But we're, right? all, we're all Americans. We grew up in the same country uh, over, the, over a period of years. We had uh, fundamentally the same education. Fundamentally, I think we understand government and how it works. Fundamentally, we understand our history uh, and, and our, our alleged shared values. How can we share values and yet be so diametrically opposed to each other? I think it does come down to language, but it also comes to a lot of other things, generational language, right? You have baby boomer language, you have Gen Xers, I'm a Gen Xer, you have millennials, and we've had shift in society over those times. Things have evolved. Just let's talk about technology a little bit, about how that's really evolved a generation, maybe in a different way of how we approach people, ourselves. Um, But I can tell you that I think people probably don't like the word dialogue because it is a kind of an arm's length um, approach to or a kind of stiff arm approach maybe in some circles right instead of saying relationship Mm -hmm. you know having a relationship but it's also intimidating in our environment right of where we feel isolated from each other whether it's technology or or some of those fundamental shifts you know between generations we have an isolation uh, one of the programs, so we know if we, I mean, listen, we're trying to foster understanding by having a conversation and leading a workshop so that people who maybe are a little hesitant to be in a conflict with someone, their coworker, you know, the community table, whatever's around that. And the conference is not about net per- journalism per se. It is about ordinary people learning to navigate these tricky, treacherous waters of conversation about things that we vehemently disagree, correct? That's correct. It's in a university setting, snobby, leftist, elite setting. Uh, do you expect... Oh, no, not, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not Queens. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but there may be people who feel that way. So will they feel welcome to this? They will feel welcome. Uh, we have a set of trained facilitators, but we also have a starting that out with the Thursday night where Amanda's going to lay some groundwork, mm-hmm. you know, in her talks to address 
everyone to really bring a a clear understanding of what the purpose is going to be on Friday. With Friday really having a lunch panel discussing um, maybe where conflict wasn't so easy to discuss, but how um, individuals have approach that and and really come to a rela- relationship even though they disagree. And, and again, we're talking about March 14th and 15th, not this weekend. Um, Amanda, we, it seems to me that this, this is a very serious topic because we are at an inflection point. If you believe what Carl Bernstein, the Watergate reporter, said recently, he says we are uh, we have our, our political discourse have, has descended into a cold civil war. And I read an article this weekend that talked about us being on the precipice of a civil war. This is really uh, scary stuff here. Uh, Who has to take the first step toward breaking through this impasse? I think it's got to be many, many fronts, right? And it's got to be regular people. It's got to be politicians. It's got to be journalists. It's got to be faith leaders, all kinds of people. And and that's the mix we've got going at this event, which is one of the reasons I'm most excited about it. It's not just me talking about journalism, right? I mean, we've got... Mm -hmm. Uh, local politicians on both sides talking about how they've tried to deal with conflict differently. And we've got uh, people who have really dealt with this at the street level, standing between police and protesters in Charlotte. So so we've we're trying to get a mix of people because this is not going to be fixed at one level. Mm-hmm. It's got it's got to be fixed at many levels. And I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, the goal is not to wash away the conflict or for everyone to agree that that would not be good for democracy, right? What we want is to be able to listen and to tolerate the discomfort of other people's opinions, learn from each other occasionally, and wade in and out of the conflict with some amount of dignity. That's that's where you get mm. progress, right? When you can hear someone who disagrees with you listen, try to understand their point of view, and then still disagree, but make your point. And what we know is that there's been a lot of research about how to do that effectively. Yelling at someone, calling them names, uh, arguing statistics even and facts doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I really wish that arguing statistics work. I mean, I spent a lot of time in my career, you know, just thinking if I could lay out the facts for people, then they would see. Um, And that's just not how the brain works. So uh, what we know, you know, there's a place at Columbia University where I visited for the piece I did on this called the Difficult Conversations Lab. And they literally study these painful, awkward conversations that people have. And they've done 500 of these and they've recorded them and analyzed them. And they found that you can open people up. You can revive curiosity in a polarizing conflict. Um, But the key to doing it is to set a tone of complexity. And when people are very entrenched, they will not hear each other. They will not listen. They will not open up to new facts, no matter how blazingly obvious they are to the other side. But if you set a tone of complexity, you can revive complex. You can revive curiosity and make people open again, which is a huge deal. We we live in this world of alternative facts, or in in cases where facts aren't facts to some people because they disagree with the facts that that are laid out before them. It doesn't meet their worldview, therefore they can't be true. This drives liberals mad. Uh, the fact that the president denies facts. Are there instances on the other side of the equation where conservatives see certain facts as facts, and in fact they are facts, but liberals refuse to see them? Absolutely. I mean, we're all human. You know, that's how humans are. (laughs) There's a thing called confirmation bias, right, Mm -hmm. where we all tend to want to believe the facts that uh, fit our narrative. And in fact, the more education you have, the more likely you are to have this bias when confronted with facts that don't fit your narrative, because you can use all the little fun tools in your brain to try to justify <laughs> your belief and uh, and dismiss the facts you don't want to hear. So this definitely happens all around. Um, there are some politicians who provoke this more than others, right, who feed into this more than others, and Donald Trump is one of them, but he is not the only one. And I see this a lot, you know, I used to write about education. I'd see this a lot on the left where people would have like really entrenched views about what's wrong with our schools and no amount of facts, no amount would 
persuade them or disrupt their narrative about it. So uh, I think this is a human thing. And one of the things I've come to conclude is that, you know how economists used to believe that humans were all rational actors, more or less, or at least that the marketplace was rational. And then eventually psychologists like Daniel Kahneman came around and convinced them that, no, you really have to build these kinds of cognitive biases into your modeling or else you're not going to get it right. You're not going to understand human behavior or predict it. Yeah. And, and that was a huge shift and created something called behavioral economics. I think that shift has not happened for much of the rest of uh, the country, particularly for journalists, but, but also for politicians. I think there, there needs to be much more sophisticated approach to uh, hearing and sharing information. That you wanted to jump in. Yes, I was just going to say that in my own experience and talking to readers who were calling to complain about something being inaccurate or unfair, um, as I would dig into that issue with them, it wasn't that they actually saw something that that was wrong. The facts were actually accurate, and they would agree with me that those facts were accurate. It was about what wasn't being reported. And so what I discovered over time was that readers were more often upset about not seeing the fuller view, the whole, what they thought, thought was the full picture. And so I think a lot of Amanda's research points to widening the lens so that you can see all that really this issue is about. And, and I think that, that in, in some cases, um, in many cases actually, I think in journalism, you know, our, our goal is to make something as simple as it possibly can be so it's easy to understand and easy to follow. And that, and that is a good goal to have. But at the same time, I think we sometimes leave out things yeah. that are important to one side or the other that are also facts. And so a lot of times that's what's missing. Yeah, and you talk, and we'll talk about this, Amanda, you, you write extensively about uh, uh, complexity uh, and not eliminating it, but amplifying the complexity of things for, for, for the better understanding of a particular uh, topic. But going back to the observer in your time there, people have always taken issue with everything under the sun. And all you had to do is read the letters to the editor to see different points of view on the same topic in the same pa paper at the same time. When did it become so rancorous th that, uh, I, I don't know how, I'm not sure how to phrase the question, where we could not politely disagree about a particular topic? You had to be demonized because you believed what you believed. When did that happen? I actually saw this begin to happen to the press in my time um, bef just before I got to the Observer uh, I was an editor at the Wichita Eagle in Wichita Kansas and mm -hmm. and I was trying to understand why I was getting so much uh, suddenly I was getting a lot of hostility a lot of that hostility was um, being um, encouraged um, and um, s spurned on by uh, radio talk the popularity rise of radio talk shows that were that were you know taking a point of view mm -hmm. uh they might have been uh, television cable television and i think with the rise of that sort of partisan media um we began to sense and feel that people were beginning to challenge you know the the perspective that we were providing that, and, and that was in the 90s and this, yes uh i remember it starting when bill clinton was uh, rumored to be running for office, and these people were calling in on another radio station that I was at, uh, talking about his uh, shenanigans in Mena, Arkansas, and I thought, I've never even heard of this man. Why do you know this about him? <laughs> but they were out to get him. Uh, this has infiltrated everything. It's not just politics. It's everything. And you write this morning in The Atlantic, uh, uh, Amanda, that uh, – most of us now discriminate against members of the other political side explicitly and implicitly in hiring, dating, and marriage, as well as judgments of patriotism, compassion, even physical attractiveness. Really? I know. It's wild. Yeah, there's been a lot of good research, very recent. There needs to be more good research, but it does reveal that there seems to be, I think it's partly because it's allowed, you know? Like how do you, how do you will... explain James Carville and Mary Madeline then? <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> Those were exceptions, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, we know that the number of politically mixed marriages is down by 50% since the 70s. So this is a big deal because it turns out that people who are married to someone on the other side of the political aisle tend to have much more complicated, moderated views of the other party's candidate, even if they don't vote for that person. Yeah. They don't necessarily see them as a monster out to destroy them. Um, and so 
the people you live with can really de-radicalize you. And since we have far fewer of that kind of political mixing in the home, uh, we we see less de-radicalization, if that makes sense. Uh, we're experiencing, Sherry, in Charlotte at least, a, a rise in gun violence and murders, and, and usually by people who know each other. The, the predominant number of people who die because of guns, in Charlotte at least, are, are people who know each other. Is this an extension of this anger that just permeates our culture right now about everything? And this is a quick fix to it. Pull that trigger. It seems to me it's a really symptom of disempowerment, right? When people are so disconnected from others, even that they know Mm -hmm. that they would take a violent act against someone else. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that, Mike. I know that this program that we're doing and the work we're about as a council is really, you know, making sure that the humanity in humanities is upfront and personal to people again. I think people are isolated. I think Amanda's report that ran in the Atlantic this morning is is showing that really clearly that people are picking the same because it's. They're isolated to that world, so I think it's some, also easy. And it's we live in a complicated world, and that's it. To pick a side and stay in that little bubble is easy. It's, it's easier, but it's also I think our pace as Americans, right? We're distracted. We're um, we're overloaded with technology. We're overloaded with task. You know, so that we've lost a collective table where differing views are there. So I think uh, we have a program that we uh, had a pilot from uh, a veterans program, actually. I mean, so this is not a new symptom. Maybe the magnitude of it is. Um, But Vietnam vets, for instance, right, they came back from that and felt very isolated um, in their community. Where's my community? Where's the engagement? Uh, The council had a program uh, that we uh, granted funds to a group of PTSD Um, Vietnam vets to really teach them how to talk about their experience and then how to write it. Uh, So really owning their own voice and reframing their conflict and their disengagement from society. uh, That's where when we learn something new at a very complex level with experts, um, we have an ability at that point, I think, to learn something new and engage in a new way. Learning something new is difficult, and and uh, it, 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 we li- it seems like this whole conversation is like swimming upstream if you want to change things, because we have gra- gravitated to our camps because it's easier to be around people who are like-minded, and we're fed information by those people that we agree with because it's something we're comfortable with. Uh, we talked a minute ago about uh, uh, broadening the widening the lens in terms of uh, newspaper coverage or journalism coverage of, of any event because it gives a broader understanding. But we live in this complex world that people want to get away from and they want simple, easy, quick answers. And we're living in an environment where media is facing tremendous pressures for profit. Uh, and so it seems to me to, to uh, complicate the narrative goes against the drive for eyeballs and ears and and um, readers, they want uh, newspapers are now online. They want people to click to the stories they like. If they find out that you're clicking a lot on cat stories, they're going to give you more cat stories. That's simplifying, not more making it more complex. How do you fight that? And I have thirty seconds. That's a that's a short term goal. If you're actually if you're actually just trying to get to clicks, right. but for the long term, you need a relationship. And I think a, a growing number of media organizations are beginning to understand that, and they are saying, yes, this more involved conversation is what people need and want. All right, we'll come back to that in a second, and we'll talk about some of these prescriptives that uh, Amanda writes about, about how we might change uh, the tenor of the conversation, at least. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, helping public radio advance journalistic excellence in the digital age. Knight Foundation believes informed and engaged communities are essential for healthy democracy. More at knightfoundation.org. And the Pump House restaurant featuring a southern-inspired cuisine in a restored multi-level pump house with a rooftop bar located at the Riverwalk in Rock Hill. More info at rockhillpumphouse.com. Author Michael Mandelbaum 
argues that the world saw true peace beginning in 1989 with the end of the Cold War. This peace, he says, ended in 2014 and that Russia, China and Iran ended it through aggressive military behavior and policies that pushed nationalism. What will it take to return to the peace the world saw 30 years ago? That's the topic of the conversation coming up in 20 minutes on 1A with Joshua Johnson. And we will continue our conversation about polite conversation. What goes into a great cup of coffee? All the right ingredients in just the right amounts. On Morning Edition, we make a blend sure to satisfy your appetite for all the news. A healthy mix of the biggest stories, eye-opening investigations, and interviews on science, the arts, and sports, too. So wake up and savor Morning Edition's perfect blend. Listen every weekday from NPR News. Listen each weekday morning from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with Amanda Ripley, uh, author, speaker, who will be here on March 14th and 15th as part of a forum called Can We Talk at Queen's University of Charlotte in the uh, Belk Chapel. Uh, Sherry Paula Watkins is helping put that together with the North Carolina Humanities Council. She's with us in our studio. Rick Thames is also part of uh, putting all this together as the visiting professor uh, for the James L. Knight School of Communications at Queen's and former executive editor of The Observer. You said just a second ago something interesting interesting about publications and news outlets, be they print or electronic, realizing that they have to start building relationships with their users. Yes. In a world where people get their news now from Twitter, from telephone apps that sometimes are and sometimes are not connected to a, a, a news outlet, sometimes they're just aggregators of news, how do you build a relationship? How do you do that? And why do you well, need to do those, that? Those Twitter feeds and those apps, they're all feeding off of original reporting by these news organizations. And some people realize that when they read that and other people don't. But right. the point is that gradually, eventually, people will understand that <clears throat> their news, local, local news, they have to rely on these local news organizations for that. The local news organizations need the support of their communities. And what I'm seeing happening in uh, the field of media today is that more and more local media organizations are relying on their um, constituents there and their marketplace to support them, not advertisers, because advertising has really fallen apart locally for, mm -hmm. uh, for them. But what they can do is through digital subscriptions, other means of donations, that sort of thing. And you're going to see a lot more of that in the next few years to come because that's how media is going to go forward on a local basis. Um, I want to bring this to, to Charlotte and, and in your article again this morning in the Atlantic, uh, Amanda, uh, where you uh, have broke you have if you do go online to do this, there, you've broken the country out with interactive maps that talk about the geography of prejudice. We rank a hundred. Charlotte ranks a hundred twenty third out of all six hundred hundred sizable counties, Mecklenburg County. 123rd out of 600 sizable counties in the country in terms of being politically prejudiced. Put that into context. What does that mean? Are, are, we, are we doing okay, or are we just sick people here? <laughs> 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 so actually, this I'm I'm so glad that you mentioned this because this is actually really hopeful uh, news. And uh, what we did was we used a, a fairly complicated statistical model to try to estimate the level of political loathing that people have for the other side and how it varies from place to place. And the, the interesting thing is it does vary quite a bit from what we found from place to place. And Charlotte does pretty well in the top quarter of the country. So uh, if it's 123rd that, out of 600, that means one is the mm -hmm. least politically prejudiced, the most politically tolerant. Um, so what is Charlotte's number, doing pretty What well. is number one? <laughs> well, it's funny you ask, because I spent quite a lot of time in the place that we found to be uh, among the least politically prejudiced places in the country, and it's a place called Jefferson County in upstate New York, uh, right by Lake Ontario, and so there's a large story about just that place. So they're really they're like. really Canadian sneaking across the border. <laughs> <laughs> they would resent that, but yeah, they're close to Canada, that's true. But it's a very conservative place, actually. Um, that went for Trump by 20 percentage points. And further in this article, you say, in general, the most politically intolerant Americans, according to the analysis, tend to be whiter, more highly educated, older, more urban, and more partisan themselves. 
that seems to not agree. I mean, you would think more educated people would be less prejudiced. More urban people would be less prejudiced because that's what we're told, that when you live in an urban area, you are exposed to the other a lot more than you are in rural areas and therefore more accepting of the other. How do you explain this? Yeah, it was when I was reading the results, I had this sinking feeling that I was basically looking at myself. I was like, oh, man, this is <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm white. I live in a city. I'm highly educated. Uh, and, and the reason is because we're talking very specifically about prejudice against the political other side. Right. We're not talking about racial prejudice. Uh, we're not talking about sexism. And it's important to note that, that these things don't go hand in hand necessarily. So what we're talking about is how you feel about people who think differently than you politically, not politicians. And this doesn't mean that, you know, it's fine to disagree with them. We're, what we tried to measure was um, your tendency to dehumanize, dismiss and disdain the other side, the other uh, voters as well as politicians. So uh, so. Part of it is definitely the exposure problem. If you uh, live in a city and are highly educated, you can pretty much create a life for yourself where you never interact with people who disagree with you politically. And that's true for conservatives and liberals. Um, so people who there's been other research showing that people who have a graduate degree have the least diverse political networks, um, for example. So when you're not actually friends with neighbors, with coworkers, with or married to someone who thinks very differently than you politically, it's very easy to caricature the other side. So, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, one of the things we looked at was the political <laughs> diversity in, at the neighborhood level. And uh, and what you find is is big variance from place to place. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about counties that did better on our ranking is that they have more political diversity. So you're more likely to encounter and know someone from the other side, which is hugely important in all kinds of prejudice. Mike, this surprised me when I read it initially, and then I began to think about it and think about how being highly educated would allow you to become more isolated. And if you think about institutions in our state, um, when you think about um, where would you be most likely to find someone perhaps who might disparage a, a Democrat, you could probably walk into any country club in the state, right? And you might hear that conversation. I know because I would I would go to these different places, and I, I was before a lot of different audiences. Um, if you walked onto a college campus, you might be most likely there to hear disparaging remarks about conservatives. Mm -hmm. And so the highly educated part really made sense to me. Um, back in the day when we had three television networks, and that was it, uh, and we had a, maybe a morning paper and an afternoon paper. We seem to be living the same lives. We seem to be having the same experience. And even if we disagreed politically on certain aspects of what was going on in society, we could talk about it. Or we didn't talk about it at all. Because I remember my parents saying at dinner with guests, you don't speak about religion and you don't talk about politics. And so we didn't. Uh, <laughs> today, we, that's all we talk about is, is politics. Um, it was my impression that um, a lot of the problem is being driven by these AM radio talk show hosts, by these far right and far left news networks, and by bad actors on social media. By that, I mean Russians or people who are just trying to inflame the conversation. But Amanda, you say that journalists haven't awakened to the fact that people are influenced by completely automatic things that we have no control over and we don't know we're doing it. But in spite of that, the media has just doubled down in the face of increasing skepticism because people don't trust mainstream media the way they used to. So we're just doubling down. on. So give me an example of something like gun control or abortion or the wall and how the media is doubling down on the old way of doing business in the face of increasing lack of trust. So typically the way you write a news story, right, is you get one side and the other side. You typically get the same people, often activists or politicians. And in reality, we know from research that that only leaves the reader more entrenched in the belief that they started reading the article with. So having both sides like that doesn't actually do what we want it to do. In fact, abortion, let's take abortion, is a complicated issue. We have a lot of research about how Americans feel about abortion. There are many things that they actually agree on and some things that they don't. Uh, most Americans think abortion should be legal in some cases. Um, so it's like 
there aren't just two sides, right? There are maybe seven or eight or 12. And writing it in a more complicated way, we know leads people to kind of open up and be more curious, uh, particularly on very polarizing But will they issues. read it? Will they read it? I mean, we're talking about people who get their, they want their news in 15 seconds. I've heard millennials talk about this. I get on my phone, I read it, I'm done. Uh, and I'm done in 15 or 20 seconds, I'm on to something else. How do, you, yeah. how do you become increasing, increasingly complex when you have to write the Encyclopedia Britannica about every topic that you write about? I don't think complexity needs to be long. I mean, I think part of it is being surprising. So when I tell you white people are the most politically prejudiced people in America, that's a headline you might click on, right? So that's fast. Didn't take that long. So being counterintuitive, surprising people with the truth, I think that's part of it. And I actually think as journalists that we underestimate the public. I think that most Americans are totally exhausted by the tenor of politics and the news. I think they are tuning out. Uh, at really high levels that aren't <laughs> that we haven't really reckoned with, I think people are just ready for something new. And I'll give you a quick example. When I wrote this piece called "Complicating the Narratives," now that is pretty long, I'll be honest. And when I took it to several big national media outlets that I have relationships with, all of them said, "This is great. Let's cut it down by ninety percent and make it not just about journalists." Uh, and so the Solutions Journalism Network, which funded this project, said, no, we kind of like it at the length it is, you know. And so we, we ended up uh, running a short expert, excerpt on theguardian.com, which is, gets huge traffic, right? And, and we did cut it way down. But then we put the whole thing up on Medium, um, and you could see it. And it went viral online, and close to 200,000 people have read this very long piece. And we got a huge amount of unexpected attention from all corners, not just journalists but regular people, politicians, designers, people, teachers were very interested in it. So I think that's an example of us as journalists, we are underestimating what the public is ready and interested in hearing. And when you put it out there, you can see that there's more of an appetite. If it's done well and carefully, there's more of an appetite for complexity than we think. I, I would agree. I would say that the public now is very tired of the sound bites. They're very tired of this, this um, the sloganeering. Um, that's what they've, they're fed up with. Mm -hmm. But if you come back and you help them understand what's really underneath this, that would be news. That is news. Yeah. Uh, you point, Amanda, to six moral foundations that form the basis of political thought. And this is not, not just particular. This is not particular to journalists or journalism. It's particular to people. Uh, you, you call them the, 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 the six moral foundations are care, to care, fairness, liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. These are the golden tickets, you say, to the human condition. This is interesting. Because you say that liberals are more attuned to care, fairness, and liberty, while conservatives are attuned to loyalty, authority, and sanctity. Is there middle ground? So these are things that all humans care deeply about. And what we find is that conservative politicians and conservative media are more likely to speak to all of them, right? They hit every note. And liberals are less likely to do so. The best thing I can advise if you want to know more about this is to read Jonathan Haidt's book called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Disagree About Politics and Religion. To me, nothing explains where we're at better than that book. And he gets into this. He's a moral psychologist. There's a lot of research on this. So these are the sort of touchstones that really move people. And you have to be aware of that when if you're trying to persuade people or if you're trying to get them to open up to new facts, that all these things matter uh, at, to different levels for different people but all of them do matter. And I, I mean, I think, you know, it's important to give people some sense of agency here. Like, I actually think regular people are pretty good. Regular Americans can be very good at disagreeing with one another. Um, and what I've found is just learning a few techniques have changed the way I behave every single day not just in my work. I mean, I do all my interviews differently now, but also in my personal life. You know, I talk to my kid differently now when, when there's conflict. I make sure he feels heard. This turns out to be the key to the kingdom. Like, people want to be right, for sure. But what they want most of all is to feel heard. And so when they say something, even when you disagree, you have to show them with real grace and, and art that you understand what they're saying, and then they will hear you. 
And this is what we're going to do. We're going to train. This is what's so cool about what Rick and and uh, Sherry Paula have dreamed up for Charlotte is we're going to actually teach this to anyone who wants to join us. So we are very excited about trying to um, really open this up to the public and yeah. teach this particular technique called looping for understanding to anyone who wants to join us at this at this workshop. How will this work, Sherry? Well, when we sat around the table envisioning, uh, you know, what what did we think would work to make this happen for everyone who attends? One, the content, right? So while we're opening up Thursday night with an expert in the field, let's let's give it some context here. Then let's also give everyone an experience. Let's have a workshop. Let's actually give someone something they can take away. But I also think there's another element here, and uh, there's a lot of work in this space um, about what what Amanda just said about people really want to go here. They maybe don't know it's always safe to go here or don't know how to go into a space that really builds relationship and actually demonstrates some care and empathy of other people's opinions and ideas and who they are. And through this uh, workshop um, of really these facilitators, if you're a concerned citizen, if you're a media professional, if you're a civic leader, I know for me, I run a nonprofit, so my hands up. I'm a student in this as well, and this is something I need in my career yeah. of really how do I lower someone's anxiety in our world of task to task to news bite to news bite? You know, how do we as people, or let's say <laughs> chore to chore, right? If you are a concerned citizen, your your task to do things is really long. You know, and this brainstorming and all of this is really puts us in a reactive mode. There's a lot of work in um, inferential focuses, work in thought um, about that space that we really have designed in this forum to have a reflection space, right? That you're going to have time after these workshops to actually reflect. So for everyday concerned citizens and individuals, having time to reflect is key. The workshops are Friday afternoon. They start at 1.30, and you can register for them. And, of course, the lecture is Thursday night, 7 o'clock. What's the best possible outcome of this forum for you, in your mind, very quickly? That they take it to each of their communities okay. and start talking. That forum, information about it is on our website at WFAE.org. It's called Can We Talk at Queen's University of Charlotte at the Belk Chapel, March the 14th and 15th. Sherry Paula Watkins with the Humanities Council, Rick Thames with Queen's University, Amanda Ripley. Thank you all for the hour. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins is a production of 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from Mom.